Good morning, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Breakfast with the Investigators. As this morning, we talk about the management of hepatobiliary cancers. We have a great uh, faculty today, uh, Dr. Uh, Katie Kelly uh, from the University of California, San Francisco, uh, Dr. Anthony L. Corey uh, from the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, and Professor Arndt Vogel from the Hanover Medical School in Hanover, uh, Germany. Uh, here's where we're heading in terms of the topics that we're going to talk about today. Uh, but we sort of did something different. Nobody's given any presentations. Uh, we're not showing a whole lot of slides. We're really here to pick the brains of investigators and to ask the questions that the people who are really taking care of these patients, a lot of them, general medical oncologists in a community-based setting, the same docs who are taking care of CLL, myeloma, breast cancer, et cetera, trying to keep up to date, which is a real challenge. So what we did is we actually did a survey of 75 general medical oncologists over the last couple weeks. We asked them, we said, these are the topics we're gonna to talk about, here's the faculty, what would you like to ask them? And actually, uh, we went through a more than, uh, eight, almost 800 questions uh, that they submitted, picked out a few of them uh, to pose to the faculty today and hopefully try to address their needs. We also asked them to sort of rate the topics in terms of you know, how interested they were to hear more about it. And interestingly, adjuvant therapy of HCC was the number one uh, thing they want to hear about. That's what we're going to uh, get started uh, on here this morning. And you can see, uh, again, how people rated the various topics. So let's jump right in and get to really I guess, one of the hottest topics right now in oncology in general, and certainly in this field, uh, adjuvant therapy. Again, we ask people how well informed they do, uh, feel about that. When you look at these graphics, the green sort of, re if you, the two greens on the left are the people who feel well informed about that. And uh, Katie, you can see there's a, a lot of interest in learning more about that. And of course, we're talking about the Embrave 050 study just presented at the AACR meeting and a little bit of data presented here as well. Katie, uh, can you kind of provide a little bit of an overview of what the study's uh, set up to look at, what we've learned about it so far, and what your take is in terms of, are you ready to do it, so to speak? Sure, so the Embrave 050 trial um, evaluated the role of adjuvant atezolizumab plus bevacizumab for 12 months or approximately 17 cycles every three weeks, just like the Embrave 150 regimen but in patients with um, high-risk HCC after either surgery or ablation. The majority of patients had received surgery, so it was uh, resections with high-risk features, either very large tumor, poor tumor differentiation, um, multifocal tumors, or any microvessel invasion, for example, were counted as high-risk factors, and so those patients were randomized to either tezobev for 12 months or active surveillance. And so um, here we see the primary endpoint, which was recurrence-free survival, and um, though the data were not mature enough to have a median, um, we could see at the 12-month landmark that the recurrence-free survival rate was much higher in the experimental arm, 78% versus 65% at the 12 months for the active surveillance arm. And so this met its primary RFS endpoint on the interim um, and um, has thus been presented as a positive study at ACR. You know, I think the, this is really exciting to see from a, a an HCC perspective is a really the, the first large adjuvant study that we've had um, with um, over 700 patients. Um, but I would caution us that we, we don't really know the long-term durability of RFS yet in terms of landmarks at key time points, one year, two year, or excuse me, after one year, 18 months or 24 months. And we don't yet have OS data to complement this. So Anthony, can you paint a little bit of a picture of who these patients are? And particularly in general, are the, these patients, and not so much in the study, but patients who uh, get primary therapy for uh, an attempt to cure HCC, transplant versus resection. What do you see in the United States in this situation? What do you see outside the United States? Actually, that's a great question because in the United States, first to be able to resect an HCC, the liver function has to be well preserved and there has to be minimal to no portal hypertension. You have to have enough liver remnant to leave behind. So that becomes a challenge, and you see that the majority of patients who get resected generally have hepatitis B or maybe fatty liver disease. 
So in the United States, we tend to resect solitary tumors mostly. Uh, in Asia, the practice is different. There is a tendency to resect multifocal disease, including branch vascular invasion, which is not the practice in the United States or, or Europe largely. So that's a big difference. In the United States, multifocal disease tends to go to resection, especially if there is underlying cirrhosis and portal hypertension. So in this study, as Katie said, there was a focus on high-risk patients. So the, even if it was a solitary tumor, it had to be above five centimeters or had to, be, had to have on uh, surgical resection poor differentiation or vascular invasion, microvascular invasion. So, you know, one of the issues aren't in general with HCC that I'm always looking for nowadays, because I just think it's really interesting, is the etiology of the HCC and how people respond. I think there's been some discussion about patients who are non-viral or NASH, for example, maybe not responding as well to IO here. Uh, for what it's worth, it looks like not too much difference. What's your take, though, Arn, on this and in terms of, we can go back, yeah, it looks like in a way like the curves are coming together a little bit. Is that because it's sort of early? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I completely agree with what, what Katie has said. I mean, it's great that we have a positive study in the IT event setting because we know that the risk of um, recurrence is extremely high after resection, specifically for these high-risk patients. But on the other hand, it's also very early, and we do not really know how this translates in overall survival. We have now seen some um, quality of life uh, data which also indicate that maybe recovery from surgery might not as good as with those patients in the control arm. So really, before we can truly recommend this, I think it would be nice to have more data, also how, um, how this translates in, in, in an overall survival benefit, if at all. I mean, this is something we really need to see. So does that mean, and here are some of the questions we got from the oncologists, and obviously the number one question is, is it ready for uh, treatment? You know, is it ready to actually do in practice? Putting, putting aside sort of regulatory uh, issues, I'll ask all three of you. Let me start with you, Katie. If you could, would you like to use adjuvant therapy outside of trial based on this data, or would you rather wait? I think I'd like to see um, some evidence of the durability of recurrence-free status with either uh, longer follow-up and um, some milestone data at 18 and 24 months because in the patients who aren't ever going to recur, we're exposing them to a potentially toxic and expensive regimen. And so I think right now I'd like to see a little bit longer follow-up. So I'm, I'm, that sounds like no, you're not quite ready. Anthony, uh, what are your thoughts? So. Whereas I agree with Katie from an academic perspective, I do believe that if I have a patient with the high-risk features and I have this available, I, I think I will use it while I'll keep an eye out on the longer follow-up data for sure. Incidentally, just to mention it, uh, uh, in terms of patients who get transplanted, I assume this is not going to be a consideration? Right. I mean, so... In, if, if a patient gets resected and then they recur, a subset of them, if they only recur in the liver, may get transplanted. Uh, and if enough time has passed, several months, I don't think this would be an issue for subsequent transplant. Usually we don't think so. Again, uh, Arndt, uh, would you like to be able to do this right now or would you rather wait? So I think the study was designed to include patients with high risk of recurrence. And as I said, which includes patients with a high tumor burden, multiple tumors, big tumors. But when you look overall, the most patients, 90% of patients had a single tumor, and the median tumor size was 5.5 um, centimeters. So I think when we recommend this, we really need to make the point it's for high-risk patients. Yeah? And um, I think the benefit when you look at the subgroup analyses was really confined to those patients in a very good ECOG performance status, and large tumors, yeah? And I think for those patients, if they are really fit, which does not confer to the majority of our patients, yeah, because many patients are in a poor performance status, yeah, but if they are really fit and have big tumors, um, if it's approved, I think it's diffic difficult not to provide it to the patients, yeah? But I completely agree with Katie that I really would like to see more data, and we have seen in other tumor types, I mean, colorectal resection of liver metastases. We do see a benefit in terms of recurrence-free survival, but in the long term, there was no survival benefit, yeah? So I think we really need to see uh, survival data. So just maybe you can look at this uh, last case here, Katie, 76-year-old man who sent in from one of the oncologists, just had a resection, stage one, 
a vascular invasion. Uh, again, would you treat a patient like that? And also, this seems to come up in every uh, solid tumor conference we do, any role for ctDNA now or in the future. So right now, uh, we, I don't think we as a field know what to do with ctDNA in HCC, either as a diagnostic or as a predictive marker of recurrence. So I have not been using that. I, I will say I use ctDNA in patients with equivocal histology that might have cholangiocarcinoma or a mixed HCC cholangiocarcinoma at the diagnostic time point. But I think right now, outside of a clinical trial, I, I have not been using it as a surveillance tool in these tumor types. So let's move on to first-line therapy of advanced um, or metastatic HCC. And for a while there, you know, it was not too complicated a discussion. We had a Tezobev. Everybody's all excited about it. And then we uh, saw the Himalaya data, so we, now we have a second option. Again, uh, docs feel, I and mean, there's been a lot of discussion about this in the last uh, year or so. They feel a little bit more uh, informed about this. Uh, but, of course, the key question here is choice of therapy. And again, uh, I'll come back to you, uh, Anthony. First of all, I'm curious what your experience is with the Himalaya regimen in terms of have you used it and how do you find it tolerability-wise? Can you compare it to a Tezobev in your own experience? Yeah. Certainly, I've used the regimen. Uh, I tend to favor the regimen for patients who have bevacizumab contraindications. My most recent example was a patient who bled from an ulcer three months ago, uh, then came to me with advanced HCC. This actually happened last week. So uh, the benefit of this regimen is that the, the tremolimumab is given once as a loading dose, uh, priming dose. And so if the patient doesn't get any immune-mediated adverse events in the first two, three months, they tend to do very well because then they're subsequently under Valumab alone. So there is certainly a, a benefit to that. Uh, and uh, the, the safety is definitely very manageable. You just have to watch for the immune-mediated adverse events uh, in, with this regimen. Uh, as far as comparing, you know, it's, it's really hard to compare across trials first. Both trials are positive compared to sorafenib. Uh, in practice, uh, certainly, I've, anecdotally, I've seen patients respond, and I've seen patients have prolonged stability of disease, same as I see with, with Atezo and Bev. So it's certainly a useful regimen in, in practice. So, of course, uh, the big question, people think a lot of when you talk about CTLA-4, think about, for example, Ipinevo, a much more common regimen right now, and, of course, increased autoimmune, colitis, et cetera, or, uh, Katie. Can you kind of indirectly, just for our reference purpose, compare immune events with the uh, Himalaya regimen versus, say, Ipinevo, need for steroids, for example. What are your thoughts? I mean, do you think if uh, Himalaya came out first, we would have been using that and sort of balked at whether, you know, whether to bring on a Jezebev? Right, so I think um, for immune-related toxicity, I think steroid requirement rate is a nice proxy for severe immune-related toxicity because it also captures the high-grade, grade twos that you need steroids for, even if they don't technically meet the grade three criteria. So I do like steroid use rate as a metric. Um, <clears throat> and so in Himalaya with the stride regimen, the single-dose tremolimumab before continuous-dose Durva, the steroid requirement, both in the study 22 large phase two preceding this and also in Himalaya was about 20% overall. And so that's certainly higher than monotherapy, where we expect steroids in the 7 to 10% range for immune checkpoint inhibitors in HCC. Um, so maybe twice as high as monotherapy. But if we compare it to Ipinevo across other tumor types, as well as HCC, as Anthony presented several years back, um, with the Nevo 1 Ipi 3 regimen, the steroid usage rate was about 50%, which is not dissimilar from what we see in melanoma or um, lung cancer and other Nevo Ipi regimens with that dosing. So it is less than half as much as what we'd expect from the, the labeled Nevo Ipi dose. And it, again, in general, you know, a lot of people, I think when they first saw the data, immediately thought of people as like Anthony's patient. But how wide is your net for concerns about, you know, if somebody's bleeding, it's one thing, but how wide is your net for wanting to flip over to Himalaya? It's Katie. Um, I am becoming more liberal about that. My case from the w past week or two is a patient who didn't have any absolute contraindications but had a history of multiple TIAs and was on anticoagulation. And I've, that is an exclusion criteria from Tezobev as a trial. And I elected for Dervatremi. But people with claudication, any peripheral vascular disease, I've been electing for the stride regimen. 
So, uh, Art, uh, I brought up this issue that I, we were starting to hear more about, about, again, correlation between etiology of the HTC and response to therapy, particularly in terms of IO uh, versus TKI. Here's a study uh, that compared atezobev to lenvatinib or sirtuinib in non-viral. Uh, any thoughts about this uh, thinking, Art? Do you think in the future or even now? There should be a consideration, etiology. Yeah, so I do not think that we need to take etiology into account for our decisions at this point in time. Yeah, we have just recently published in Journal of Hepatology an update of uh, the published study, and you can see that um, checkpoint inhibitors are active also in patients with non-viral liver diseases. It's, I think it's a we, we need to acknowledge it's really a mixed bag. Yeah? Usually we do not have one etiology, but multiple. Patients drink too much, eat too much, are obese, so it's NASH and ASH. You can call it BASH or MASH, yeah? so it's uh, difficult to distinguish sometimes. Yeah? So we do not really have good biomarkers to, to, to identify the leading cause. Yeah? And in general, when we look at the data that have been published, IO checkpoint inhibitors are active in non-viral liver disease. Yeah? In the future, we might think about different combination therapies, for example, depending on etiology. Yeah, but just because patient has a NASH, I would still continue with a checkpoint inhibitor uh, therapy, and I would not go to a TKI if there are no other contraindications. So, uh, Katie, here are some of the many questions uh, we got about HCC. A lot of people about um, patients with uh, poor liver function here, child PUC. But in general, Katie, can you talk about how you think through first-line therapy in people who have a, a severe cirrhosis? Yeah, I think in the, the higher score child PUBs and child PUCs, it becomes a case-by-case -case individualized assessment of exactly why are they child PUC. Is it just their albumin plus one or two other parameters that add up inconveniently, or is it because of decompensated disease with active progression worsening week by week? So if it's somebody who's very stable and it's a sort of a numerical anomaly where one day they're B9, the next day C10, and the next day B9 again, but stable over a period of time, I tend to consider um, a checkpoint inhibitor, now dervalumab potentially. Um, these are all outside of prospective data range because we don't, these are difficult populations to study, but I find um, the hepatic decompensation rates with single agent checkpoint inhibitor to be very reassuring from the NEBO um, checkmate 040 child PB cohort in particular prospectively. Um, occasionally, so in child PC, that's, I think I would either consider palliative care or a single agent checkpoint inhibitor. Same for a high score B9. So Arne, what about this last question? We'll come back to the middle one in a minute, but the patient is very symptomatic. Uh, you really want a rapid response. This uh, case of a patient with severe, uh, uh, painful uh, bony mets. Uh, uh, any uh, thought about that? Are you still sticking with your uh, atezobev or Himalaya, or would that get you to think about a TKI, aren't? I mean, at the moment, we can only do this cross-trial comparison, and at the moment, um, atezobev has the highest response rate of 30%. So if I really would like to see a response, I would probably go with that. All right. Um, and again, with so many other questions, but I think we're going to move on now and talk about second line uh, and beyond. Again, I think it looks like there's a lot of interest in that. You know, kind of like when atezobev came in, it sort of changed everything, because all prior to that, the second and third line therapies, patient had gotten upfront TKIs, so he sort of had to uh, think about it. Uh, but again, let me come back to Katie and say in general, how do you think through choice of second line therapy right now? So I think right now, if somebody has progressed on a first line immune checkpoint inhibitor based regimen, I tend to try something different and favor different targets. So usually we'll use a multi-kinase inhibitor um, such as lenvatinib or cabozantinib. How do you decide which one? Largely based on toxicity profile. So if a patient has really problematic blood pressure or proteinuria or other toxicities related to BEV, the VEGF inhibition component of BEV, um, I will sometimes favor CABO, which has slightly lower rates of those VEGF-related toxicities than LENVA, which has higher proteinuria, higher hypertension. That's generally how I choose right now. So uh, also, there had been a question before, and I think it relates to second line as well. Again, one of the most common questions we started to hear once we you know, got the atezobev data and started to see 
responses, uh, Anthony, uh, which is the issue of liver-directed therapy versus systemic therapy. For a long time, we've heard from oncologists, you know, the interventional radiologists come in there. By the time we see the patient, they've done multiple procedures. The patient's liver has, you know, uh, been affected. Uh, maybe, you know, we should be using systemic therapy earlier now that we're seeing responses. What have you seen over the last few years, Anthony, in terms of liver-only uh, disease and whether or not you use liver-directed therapy or systemic therapy? So liver-only disease is a big heterogeneous <coughs> group, right? And that's what we have to think about when we first see the patient. And it's now actually, if we follow the BCLC uh, guidance, uh, certainly by low bar or infiltrative type disease, now we should probably go directly to systemic therapy in those patients. There's sufficient evidence from the first-line systemic therapy data of these patients doing quite well. And there is data from liver-directed therapy that indicates that the, the response and the outcomes are inferior when you have multifocal disease or larger tumors. So I think the, it's the extent of liver-limited disease that sways me one way or another. In addition, the level one evidence when you have liver-limited disease with vascular invasion is for systemic therapy. There's not level one evidence for vascular invasion and liver-directed therapy. So some of these uh, questions um, I think are worth exploring aren't a question here about dosing of cabozantinib. Do you start at a lower or high dose? How do you approach to the use of cabozantinib? And is it different in a patient with a lot of liver uh, dysfunction or patients who are in good condition? Um, I think it's valid to, to also consider starting with a lower dose. I think it's difficult to predict really who will develop side effects. And I mean, some patients that are fit and maybe younger, I, I tend to start with a full dose. Yeah, But um, I think it's also a good idea to start with a lower dose if you are concerned um, uh, about toxicity. I think the most important point is really that we keep patients on the treatment and that they do not um, stop treatment due to toxicities. Therefore, I think either way is, is good and it needs to be really decided on a per patient basis. So uh, Katie, uh, down there at the bottom, dosing of lenvatinib. This is uh, heavily debated in other scenarios. For example, uh, Pembro lenvatinib that's used in metastatic, for example, endometrial cancer. A lot of discussion about uh, dosing there, what to start with, how to modify it. How do you uh, approach dosing of lenvatinib, Katie? So, of course, the, the labeled dose is 12 milligrams of weight is greater than um, 60 kilos. And so, in a, like a patient that aren't just described, a, a fit young patient with very preserved liver function, I'll use the, the labeled dose. But I, I will say that I tend towards anyone who's towards the lower weight range or towards more liver decompensation, I'll start with eight and occasionally even four milligrams if someone's very frail and escalate up, even though, again, that's not the labeled dosing. I, I will be conservative in, in more delicate liver function, delicate patients. Katie, what about third-line therapy? Can you maybe talk about sort of what your usual, I don't know how many patients actually get to third-line, which is another question, but sort of when you, what are you thinking about second and third-line? Mm -hmm. So if we look at, say, the study 22, the precursor study to Himalaya, which was a, you know, over 200 patient randomized phase two internationally, around a third to a, quarter, to a half of those patients went on to get a third line. So that's obviously clinical trial eligible patients, but it is not an insignificant number. So I'd say a lot of our patients get third line. Um, I often, if, if patient hasn't received CABO in second line, I will almost certainly use CABO in third line. Um, the other thing I will use in patients, for example, let's say we did Atezobev, then um, Cabo, and if now it's a third line context. If it's a very fit patient, I will use Nevo Ipi if they haven't already had a CTLA 4 inhibitor. Uh, Anthony, can you comment on Ipi Nevo and HCC? Yeah, so the Nevo Ipi data is, is really post sorafenib data. Uh, and there were three different schedules and doses explored. The one that has accelerated approval is NEVO-1, IP-3 milligrams per kilograms, every three weeks for four doses, and then you continue NEVO alone. I think that the regimen, the challenge of it is what Katie mentioned earlier, the 50% requirement for steroid usage for immune-mediated events. So you want to pick the right patient and you want to manage them carefully. The response rate was an amazing 30%. Uh, post-sorafenib, and this is the objective response rate. And the median OS with that regimen was actually 22 months 
post-sorafenib. So it's quite an active regimen, but has to be used in the right setting. Currently, there is a first-line randomized study of nevo epi with that dose compared to sorafenib or linvatinib that hasn't read out yet. Uh, interesting. I, has uh, Dervatremi been looked at in the second line or third line? No, I don't believe so. Well, the study 22 was a oh, predominantly yes. second-line population, right. so about 75% of those patients had prior serafinib, and so its, its efficacy it was predominantly second-line, and the STRIDE regimen had a response rate of 24% and uh, encouraging survival 18-plus months in that setting. So would you, and based on your earlier comments that you see less autoimmune problems with Dervatremi, would you consider that in the second or third line? I think if, uh, it, again, if, it were, if I could get an insurance authorization, I would certainly be in favor of considering it. Interesting. So final question here. Interesting that one of the oncologists, Arndt, brings up patients with paraneoplastic syndromes with HCC, for example, erythrocytosis. Do you treat them any differently, Arndt, and what's your experience with it? What kind of paraneoplastic syndromes have you seen? So honestly, <clears throat> in, in daily clinical practice, I have not seen it too many times. And um, I think we do not have any data to, to think about a different treatment approach, so I would treat them as I would uh, uh, treat patients without uh, paraneoplastic syndromes. Anthony, uh, Katie, have you seen paraneoplastic? Mean, when I saw that question, I was like, hmm, paraneoplastic. Have you seen that? I've seen it rarely. And uh, I mean, anecdotally, in a couple of cases, I probably did see an improvement in the erythrocyte count with, with response. but. I don't think we have really solid data. I, I completely agree. A couple times a year, I'll see a, a high hematocrit, like a polycythemia that we think is of malignancy due to erythro, uh, erythropoietin tumor elaboration, but I would treat them just like any perineoplastic, treat the tumor with our, an active regimen. All right, let's talk about biliary tract cancers. Uh, I call this the new non-small cell lung cancer. We were talking about last night and not on lung cancer. We had like 13 different targets we were talking about, but... Biliary tract's starting to come up there. I'm kind of wondering in a couple of years, maybe we'll be up to uh, these number of targets. Really amazing. Uh, so, of course, one of the issues, and this, uh, uh, again, oncologists feel a little bit better informed, I think, about first-line therapy. Most of, the, uh, most of them have heard about the Topaz study and are actually implementing it. Uh, but let's just go back and uh, kind of talk a little bit about that. Anthony, uh, what were your thoughts when you first saw, saw this study? And uh, a lot, it seems like a lot of people have adapted it. Have you? Yes. Uh, I mean, we now have two trials showing the benefit of adding an anti-PD-1 or PDL one agent to the backbone of gemcitabine cisplatin. Consistent results across both studies. Now, the hazard ratio is 0 0.8, uh, around 0 0.8 uh, for both. Um, so that is a benefit. It's a relatively small benefit. Um, it's still hard to say which subset of patients benefits the most. The benefit seems to be across all groups, but uh, so for now, I am using it for all patients who with first-line uh, biliary cancer who qualify for anti-PD-1 therapy. Which one? I mean, currently, the, uh, the approval is for Durvalumab. We don't have PEMRO approval. And I don't, from the data presented, I really don't see that a huge differentiator. The difference with the keynote study that Katie presented at AACR is that the continuation was with gemcitabine and Pembro. With, with the Topaz study, it was Durvalumab alone that was continued. Um, does that make a huge difference? I don't know what you think, Katie. So I, I think that they both validate each other. The, the two results are very consistent, and I think that, you know, it's just important to remember that in the keynote 966 trial at the six-month mark, a uh, majority of patients who are still on treatment continued their gem, and so we don't see quite as big of a separation of the curve occurring right at that time point as opposed to in Topaz. Everyone had to stop the gem. So I think it's, it's what it really reinforces to me is that whatever our clinical decision is for that patient at six months, if we think, oh, this is someone who would benefit for a few more months of chemo, Keynote 966 tells us that's a reasonable choice and that the, data, the benefit is preserved even with continuation with chemo. Topaz tells us if this is someone who's really fatigued and needs a break from chemo, continuing Durva, and I think I would extrapolate continuing Pembro, either one would be beneficial. So I think it doesn't tell us which, which partner to use. I think it tells us both of them are active and that the strategy is active. So, uh, Arn, I'm curious, again, putting aside uh, the ability to access or approvals, regulatory, et cetera, whether you have any preference one way or the other. And oh, in what situations would you not do this? 
uh, particularly uh, people with history of prior autoimmune disease, how much will get you to pull back from using an IO in this situation? Yes, I agree with what Anthony has said before. It is really difficult to, to make a distinction between Pembro and Dover. I mean, they look very, very similar, and maybe it will be more an emotional decision, right, and not an, so much an academic decision to choose either drug. Um, I think the majority of patients are really candidates for checkpoint inhibitors in BTC, and I have seen in, 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 in most countries that whenever it's available, um, that the uptake is really amazing. Yeah? So, um, I mean, Anthony said the benefit is moderate, right? Um, of course, we would like to see a bigger uh, difference, but I think um, everybody was waiting for these data, and now we have two global positive phase three studies, and it's really um, implemented in daily clinical practice. Yeah, and I hardly see any patients without a checkpoint inhibitor in first line. Katie? I would just say the one population that I don't think we have a lot of data on that's enriched in biliary tract cancers are those patients, particularly with higher or extra hepatic of a history of IBD and pr uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Um, so uh, ulcerative colitis may predispose patients to have PSC who then get a, uh, cholangio. And those, any patients with active IBD have been excluded from these trials largely. And we don't have yet subset data for patients with quiescent IBD who were actually enrolled. And so that's what I'd like to see maybe as a, you know, an ideal world as a meta-analysis or a pooled analysis of PSC patients. I mean, this is actually a very good point, and um, we have seen some patients with PSC and overlap with autoimmune hepatitis, and I think it's really important to look very closely whether there's any underlying liver disease, and I remember one patient which really developed a severe flare of, their, of her um, autoimmune hepatitis, so um, these underlying autoimmune diseases are important, and they can be somehow hidden under a PSC, yeah? so that's definitely something we, we should uh, consider. Really interesting. So uh, an unexpected theme to this meeting that came out a lot when, in these uh, questions from uh, general oncologists is the uh, inability to access uh, some chemotherapy agents, uh, particularly, looks like ones that are generic, so, but particularly uh, carboplatin and cisplatin. Uh, Katie, this is a, seems to be a pretty common problem in the community, but I hear it in some academic centers as well. Have you been dealing with this yourself? and any advice you would give to people who can't access, in some cases, both cis and carbo? Right, I think um, a couple points specific to biliary tract cancer, you know, obviously we all want to use cisplatin or aplatinum when we can. I think one thing to remember when discussing in our, our our tumor groups and our pharmacy groups at our institutions is that the dose of cisplatin in biliary tract cancer is so much lower than other tumor types. It's only 25 milligrams per meter squared. So we can treat maybe three biliary tract cancer patients compared to any other solid tumor type. So in the first line setting, I, I will still be advocating to get our share of the cis because we can treat more patients with the same amount. Um, and it does, ARNT has data, it does really make a difference. Um, that said, if we have to substitute, I think oxaliplatin is a backup plan if, if carbo is also not available. Um, I also will be tending towards, you know, potentially stopping the cisplatin a little early in that six-month window and then considering reusing it later if, if, if push comes to shove. So, uh, Anthony, uh, any thoughts about that? Would you add uh, Derva, for example, to, say, Gemox? Yes, I mean, we would be extrapolating, but we would not expect any major safety concerns about uh, having oxaliplatin with Derva uh, in this setting. So. Uh, Arn, any, any uh, thoughts about this last question on there? Uh, high TMB, uh, any situations where you would consider something like Ipinevo first line? Do you ever see MSI high, incidentally? Track. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you look for MSI, you will find MSI high in, in, in BTC. And I mean, we have done a study recently, um, and MSI can be found in around 1% to 2% of patients with BTC, and TMB high in around 3 to 4%. So these are rare patients. But I think it's an interesting question, what should we do with these patients, and should we go for an IO? only therapy, or should we combine it with chemotherapy? I think it's not very defined in the TOPAS and keynote studies. The number of patients with TMB high or MSI were really small, and we do not really have the data for that. Um, I, I think there are some retrospective data suggesting that um, chemo might play a role also in these patients. So at this point in time, I pr would probably start with Gemsys Dorvar and would not use um, nevo IP because for nevo IP we really do not have a lot of data. I mean, I think it's a very active and interesting regimen, 
Um, but in BTC, I would probably stick to Gemsys Dorba. So I'm curious, uh, Katie, if you see, you know, you always hear these great cases, MSI high, they get an IO, Pembro, whatever, they're out two years, doing great, you're trying to decide whether to stop it. You seen that with BitBill, your track? Yes, I have a handful, a collection now, of, small collection of patients who have had uh, somatic MSI high with associated TMB high, who've received a checkpoint inhibitor as monotherapy, either, even in, I've used it in first line, I've used it in second or later line, and a subset of those have prolonged complete responses. So uh, let's talk a little bit. We mentioned uh, the idea of targeted therapy. And uh, before we get into the specifics, you know, I was sort of joking about it being uh, like non-small cell, Anthony. But one of the things that we talked a lot about last night in our non-small cell uh, program was what appears to be the lack of benefit of IOs in many of the patients who have uh, targetable lesions, EGFR, uh, ALK, for example, sometimes uh, they don't even get treated with IOs because they're so ineffective. What do we know in terms of response to IO uh, and biliary tract cancer in these patients with uh, targetable uh, mutations? So the short answer to that is we don't have data yet. Uh, hopefully we will get data uh, in, the, in the near future on some of these, but currently we, we really don't have a lot of data with the various actionable mutations and response to I.O. Um, and a lot of the target, targeted therapies are now being used as we will get come to in second and third line post I.O. anyway. Right. So, and again, uh, you can see how oncologists think about this. There's a lot of questions about this. Of course, uh, Monday morning we're doing a program on uh, bladder cancer, and there we have uh, ertafitna, but they, a lot of people have had some exposure to. But here, uh, two of the key drugs right now are pemigatin and afutabatinib. Uh, Katie, can you talk a little bit about uh, what FDR fusions are and how they're diagnosed? Uh, we've got a lot of questions from the oncologist about uh, how you diagnose it and what's the criteria. So FGFR fusions occur in uh, around 10% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas and extremely rarely in extrahepatic or gallbladder. And in fact, if I saw one, I'd worry if it's probably an intrahepatic misdiagnosed. But they, um, are, what occurs is that there will be a, a fusion or rearrangement of the normal um, wild-type coding region of FGFR2 to a different um, partner gene that then leads to constitutive or unregulated activation of the wild-type FGFR2 gene. And so um, an FGFR2 inhibitor or a pan-FGFR inhibitor with activity on FGFR2 has shown significant efficacy in those patients with re rearrangements and fusions. And how to diagnose, it really needs to be an NGS panel that is validated with FGFR2 in mind, which covers some of the intronic regions because these rearrangements and breakpoints can be anywhere in the non-coding area. Do you need to do an RNA uh, assay? It doesn't have to be an RNA. RNA is best because then you'll be more likely to pick up the, the, a, a rare un, uncharted fusion or rearrangement, but an NGS panel that has been validated for FGFR2 that covers a broad stretch of the gene can also be effective. So, Arne, can you provide a little bit of an overview of what we know about FGFR inhibitors? And, of course, again, the question oncologists have, which one's the one that you use? Uh, looks like the data is relatively you know, similar across uh, the different, but maybe there's some subtleties that we're not aware of. Can you talk a little bit about uh, clinically, uh, sort of when you think about these drugs, what we know about their efficacy? Yeah, so I, I think it's very good that we have, I mean, different FGFR inhibitors have been tested, and it's good to see that we always see waterfall plots like this. So the, the efficacy is very consistent. Um, it's a class effect, as you uh, can hear nicely seen with um, Fudibatinib. I think doing here a cross dry comparison um, and, and considering whether one is more active than the other is difficult at this point. Um, they have be all been tested in, in the second and further line setting, so we do not yet have data in the first line setting. Um, there are some differences in terms of um, whether they are irre irreversible or reversible um, FGFR inhibitors. Some, like Fudibatinib, do have activity against um, resistance mutations, so we can sequentially treat our patients. So, starting with Pemigatinib, for example, if they have an on target resistance mutation, some of the patients respond to Fudibatinib, so sequential therapy is. Um, 
possible. And but at this point in time, I think both are valid drugs. And most important is that we really test our patients and that we use the right assay. And because it's as Katie, uh, Katie has said, it's really difficult um, to detect these fusions. Um, and this is really of, of most important to to test early with the right assay. So of course, uh, Katie, you know, again, being a general medical oncologist nowadays is can be a real adventure when you see new drugs and new toxicities. We just did an entire program on, on ophthalmic complications of uh, anti-cancer therapy. It's like every organ in the body you have to be thinking about. These FGFR inhibitors have some interesting tolerability issues. Can you talk about what they are and what your experience is? Yes, so um, first before I forget, just as for everyone to be aware, there's a, another FGFR2 inhibitor being presented tomorrow, which is the Relay4008 trial updates in the um, targeted therapy session in the afternoons. So back to toxicity, though, I think some of the interesting toxicities for FGFR2 inhibitors that we've really seen as a class effect um, include the central serous retinopathy or subretinal fluid development. So patients do need a baseline eye exam and a close uh, follow-up at least every one to two cycles um, or as needed by symptoms earlier with an ophthalmologist. Um, another side effect that is bothersome or I think is very helpful to warn patients of in advance are the fingernail toxicities. People will get first nail ridging, color changes, mild on but over time, these great responses are often associated with complete nail loss, where patients will just lose their fingernails. And again, if, if I warn patients about it and help them, you know, manage sort of the intermediary steps of when they get loose and a little, sometimes some paronychia, we talk about, you know, using a Band-Aid or a, a way to kind of help stabilize the nails and while they're in the process of falling off, use topical antimicrobials you know, mupiracin or other agents to help if there's any local infection. It helps people to know that in advance. So nail toxicity is another one. And then the third is hyperphosphatemia for the, um, for most of the drugs that have pan-FGFR activity because FGFR1 um, targeting will cause hyperphosphatemia and majority, usually over 70% of patients will need a FOS binder or some management. Got our chat room team is also sending in some really great questions. So Hassan in the chat room, Wants to know, will liquid biopsy, Anthony, pick up FGFR? Uh, it's getting better at, at, at detecting FGFR, but uh, I, I think uh, we don't have a 100% concordance. So it's still important to test the tumor for this. So uh, um, interesting case here, and then we're going to move on actually to IDH uh, mutations, but aren't, and I've heard cases like this. I'm not sure how you think it through. 72-year-old metastatic biliary tract cancer, Two status post team, two chemo regimens, but as IDH1 and FGFR fusion, have you seen that? And like, what do you do? Yeah, actually, we have seen uh, a few patients with both F um, IDH1 mutations and um, FGFR2 mutations, and also fusions. Um, personally, I think that that FGFR2 fusion is the stronger driver compared to IDH1, and also when you look at the, I mean, again, cross trial comparison, different drug types. Um, but we do see a higher efficacy of, of the FGFR inhibitor. So I think the majority of tumors really are more dependent on this FGFR signaling. And therefore, in a case like that, I would start with the FGFR inhibitor and probably use the IDH1 inhibitor in, in a second line or um, subsequently. Do you uh, retest uh, looking for change in mutation status, yeah, Anthony? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, for FGFR, you, I would really strongly recommend to do a rebiopsy of the progressive lesions to really look at the underlying mechanism. I mean, and as I said, I mean, when you start with pemigatinib specifically, you can have these on-target mutations. And um, Katie already mentioned the Relay drug, which is really active against many of these resistance mutations. So I think we do have options. And actually, I have one patient that I have treated first with Pemigatinib, Futibatinib, and uh, she's now in the um, RELI study, so the third FGFR inhibitor. Therefore, I would strongly recommend to do a rebiopsy in patients with FGFR2 fusions. Memories of ALK last night, same, same kind of story. All right, let's talk about IDH uh, mutations, Katie. You know, general oncologists uh, sort of got a quick introduction to that with AML. You know, AML has really changed, particularly in the older patient that we used to have nothing to do. Now we have HMA venetoclax, but also uh, IDH, uh, FLT3, and a targeted therapy in AML is here. A lot of oncologists have experience there, but you also, uh, as we've been talking about, see this uh, in biliary tract cancer. 
Katie, can you kind of paint a picture of where you see IDH mutations, what kind of mutations you see, both IDH1 and 2, and what you see from IDH inhibitors when you sequence them? Right, so um, IDH1 mutations occur in about 13%, 15% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, again, heavily weighted towards intra and very rare in other locations. Um, and what they do is they cause a, a differentiation block due to a downstream metabolite of IDH, the mutant IDH1 called 2-hydroxyglutarate, which allows these cells to just keep proliferating without differentiating, and that's, of course, a hallmark of cancer. And so ivacitinib is a mutant IDH1 inhibitor, does not inhibit wild type, and restores that differentiation. And so it's really a cytostatic mechanism where it helps the cells differentiate and stop growing, but it's not usually associated with a huge response rate. In fact, the response rates are generally less than 5% in the cholangiocarcinoma trials to date, though occasionally we'll see a patient with an unexplained exuberant response. We've had a, hand, a couple patients like that where they do actually have responses. Um, but the majority of patients treated with ivacitinib um, will have stable disease, and that's what we see from the endpoint of the trial, which, of the clarity trial, the phase three trial that established ivacitinib in this setting, is that we see prolonged progression-free survival. Some patients are on this tail of the curve that can be quite prolonged. The median is, you know, by a, a month or two, between, almost two months. Any p uh, patients come to mind, Katie, that you had a good outcome that you can recall? Yeah, I think um, I've had several patients. We have one patient who's had stable disease for over three years on ivacitinib. That was one patient who also had a response. Um, I've also had a patient without response, but who's had, been on for about a year and a half. Most patients, it's shorter, but again, there are patients who reach this tail of the curve, and we, we obviously would love to know why. And uh, Anthony, I'm curious, again, your experience, whether you've had patients with prolonged stable disease. Also, uh, questions, of course, all the new therapies, the docs want to know about tolerability issues. But one thing that's kind of interesting, of course, in AML, you have the one main issue is differentiation syndrome. I don't think you would see it here. Um, but what do you see, if anything, and have, in terms of tolerability issues, Anthony? And again, have you seen patients with prolonged stable disease? Yeah, I, I would say actually the tolerability of Ivacitinib is quite manageable in, in, in uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, I think you see fatigue, you see some minor GI and nausea, anorexia. Uh, I think everything else was actually quite rare. If, I, if I'm remembering correctly. So I, I think uh, it's, it's uh, quite manageable uh, in this population. So aren't, uh, putting aside you know, the ability to access the drug and just focusing kind of on you know, clinical algorithms, interesting case here from one of the oncologists who had a patient who got the Topaz regimen first line, IDH1 mutation, the doc wanted to give ibocitinib, but the patient went for a second opinion and the second opinion to the surprise of the oncologist said, hold off on that, let's try some full theory. And uh, quote, because as Katie was mentioning, the response rate was low and the patient progressed. The oncologist felt a little frustrated. How do you think about sequencing uh, IDH inhibitors? Yeah, I think it's a I mean, very valid point. And um, so what I said before, that I think that not all of the tumors really depend heavily on the IDH1 mutations, yeah, and this is reflected by the low response rate, I think, and also that around 30 to 40 percent of patients have progressive disease, yeah. So we there's a subgroup within a subgroup of patients that respond, and we do not have a good biomarker. So I think we definitely need, and it's an expensive drug. We also have to acknowledge, right? And so therefore, I think. When we, I mean, I would start these targeted therapies as early as possible when the tumor burden is not too high. But in case of ID, um, IDH1 uh, mutations, I would recommend to do an early CT scan after eight, eight weeks, for example, to see whether we can get disease stabilization or not. And I think in the future, we definitely need either additional biomarkers or combinations. Yeah, and there are already very interesting preclinical data su suggesting that the combination with a CTLA4 checkpoint inhibitor might add activity. And I think this is the way where, where we need to go in the future, um, that we combine this drug with, with other therapies. But we need the trials. So we're getting some great questions from the audience and the chat room. I'm going to try to save some of these for the end, because I really want to ask you also about HER2. seems like HER2 is popping up all, all over the place nowadays. Uh, I'm going to get to that for sure. Uh, but um, now why don't we talk about it right now? We saw some really interesting data uh, right here at this meeting, uh, looking at this uh, yesterday, uh, a bunch of new uh, papers coming out. Uh, so let's talk about uh, HER2, I guess, uh, positive. Uh, so we know last night we were talking about that can be 
HER2 overexpressing, as we talk about, or uh, amplified in breast cancer, but also HER2 mutant, which is really the target in non-small cell uh, that we were talking about. Uh, Katie, what's the incidence of uh, HER2 positivity, both types of HER2? And maybe you can talk a little bit about what we know about some of these uh, new strategies, TDXD, which again seems to be popping up all over the place, certainly in upper GI, colorectal, uh, lung, of course, uh, breast, but also these other strategies, Ducatinib, uh, Trastuzumab, already being used right now in colorectal cancer a lot, uh, and Zanidanumab, uh, which we were talking about yesterday with upper GI cancers, really fascinating uh, by specific. Katie, can kind of paint a picture of your vision of HER2-positive biliary tract cancers? So I think it's a... Um when we, know, when we look at the incidence of HER2 positivity, if we're looking first at protein expression-based um, IHC metrics, um, we know that gallbladder has the highest incidence of HER2 overexpression, um, upwards of 15 to 20% range. Um, next is extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, maybe in the you know, 10, 15% would be my estimate. I think they cited at the paper presentations yesterday a little higher than that even. And then intrahepatic is lower, but not zero. So it's not as binary as say FGFR2 or IDH1, which are nearly exclusive to intrahepatic. Um, we do see around 5% of intrahepatic with HER2 overexpression. As far as mutations, those are rarer, and I don't know that there is dichotomous or that there's a predilection for anatomic subsite as much as expression. Um, but there are a subset, a couple percent of patients, is my understanding, with HER2 activating mutations across the subsites. So let's talk about these uh, new therapies. Anthony, first, I don't know if we're, people are calling it Zanny or not, but uh, it is a little bit easier to uh, pronounce. Can you talk about what was presented here and published, as a matter of fact, uh, in Lancet Oncology? Well, first of all, what is it? It's a bispecific. Yeah. So zanidatumab is a bispecific that binds to two domains on the HER2, on her ACD2 and 4, uh, which really gives it this superior efficacy in preclinical data as well as emerging clinical data. Uh, what was presented yesterday is a study with, uh, this study had 80 patients, and uh, all of them were FISH or ISH positive, um, and uh, were also HER2 three plus. And in these patients, you see a response rate in the low 40 per 41 percent, which is, you know, quite impressive. Uh, a disease control rate that's close to 70 percent, and the responses actually were quite durable. So definitely a strong signal of efficacy was zanidatumab. Uh, the other data set that was presented was the combination of tucatinib and trastuzumab. Hold off on that one first. Let's finish out about the Zani, and here's the uh, waterfall plot. Yes. Now, this is monotherapy, because yesterday we were talking about it in, up, in uh, gastric, and it was chemo, IO, and a combination, but now you're talking about monotherapy here. What do you see in terms of tolerability issues? Yes, so this was monotherapy, and it was, of course, post-gemcitabine-based regimen in, in second line. Um, so as far as tolerability here, I think the most common, as you can see here, is diarrhea followed by infusion-related reactions. The ejection fraction decreases with this drug tend to be quite transient and generally asymptomatic, uh, but I think it's something to be followed. So I would say GI and infusion-related reactions, all these patients had to be pre-medicated for infusion-related re reactions, actually. But that's interesting in terms of the ejection fraction. So is it recommended to do uh, to follow ejection fraction in these patients? Yes, so I would definitely obtain a baseline echo and then do them every two to three cycles and as well as follow patients symptomatically. Is it thinking this is kind of a trastuzumab type of, you know, effect, which is, you know, pretty not that strong, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a class effect of targeting HER2, yeah. So uh, aren't uh, seeing this data, is this, this enough to make you want to use it? If you could, would you use it, and when? Yeah, so I, I think the data are really compelling. We have, um, as Anthony said, 80 patients that have been included. The response rate is 40% with chemo. I mean, we hardly see responses even in the first-line setting. It's below 30%. So this, these drugs are really active. And I mean, we do have a lot of drugs that have been tested in the past, and I, I think there's a 
clearly a class effect. We do see high responses, and therefore I definitely would like to use it in the, in the second line setting. I think we do not yet have data for the first line setting, and secondary resistance is always an issue, of course. Um, but in the second line setting, where we really do not have good options with chemotherapy, um, I would definitely use it, and I would consider that these data are su sufficient to get approval. Sounds like practice changing to me. Do you, you both agree? Yep. Interesting. 80 patients are ready to go. All right, let's talk about uh, tucatinib trastuzumab. Uh, Anthony, uh, as we were saying, this is now commonly being used in colorectal cancer. I'm hearing good things about it in terms of tolerability and efficacy. What do we know about it in biliary tract? Have you used it yourself on trial? Uh, so I've used it myself on trial, yes. So th this, the idea here is, is using a TKI, which is tucatinib, and an antibody, trastuzumab, concurrently. This was part of a multi-tumor uh, phase two trial, um, and the biliary tract cohort that was presented is, is small. It's 30 patients. But what we see here is, intriguingly, this consistent response rate in the low 40% range, again, with this regimen. Here it is close to 47%, and again, quite durable responses. Uh, the, the toxicity profile is slightly different. Uh, you see the waterfall plot looks quite similar, except there are fewer bars because it's a smaller population. Uh, and uh, then, as far as... The, the toxicity profile is, again, as I said, is slightly different, so a little bit more uh, hepatic abnormalities, AST, ALT elevations uh, with this, with this regimen. Um, but I think we're, we're going to need a bit of a bigger population here to, to validate the signal. So you want to see a little more data before you yeah. use it. Uh, Katie, uh, what about the, you know, uh, tucatinib in breast cancer, we're going to talk about on Monday night using a, a, a regimen with trastuzumab, capecitabine, but particularly noteworthy for the CNS effect, and in HER2 positive breast cancers, you see more brain mets. What about brain mets in biliary tract cancer and tucatinib in that situation? I think if, if one had a patient that you knew had a brain metastasis and were HER2 positive, it would certainly be um, a, a great idea to, to consider that drug. Um, but brain mets and biliary tract cancers are quite rare. We actually did a retrospective analysis of a large brain tumor registry at Stanford combined with the UCSF Cancer Center registry, and we saw incidents in the 1% or less range. Um, so certainly they happen, but they're, they're not a, it's not a predilection site for biliary tract cancer metastases. So, uh, Anthony, what about uh, TDXD? Again, we've seen, seen this in multiple uh, uh, cancers. What do we know about it uh, in biliary tract cancer? It looks like responses have been observed. Yes, again, I would say a consistent signal here with, with the response rates. Um, and you see here that this population was slightly different in there. There were actually some third-line patients as well. Uh, which I think is consistent when, when we target HER2. I don't think the line of therapy matters too much whether we did it in second or third line. So, uh, Katie, what are you thinking about? Is theoretically, we might have multiple anti-HER options in the next couple of years. Any thoughts about how this is going to play out? Do you see it moving earlier? Do you see it in the neoadjuvant setting? Any thoughts? So I think, as Anthony said, the, the consistency of the data response rate rise is telling us that this is a, an active pathway to target, and we should be defining, just like FGFR and IDH1 and MSI high, we have ERB2 mutant, or, or actually predominance of the data is overexpression right now, but our amplification. But we, I think we need more data for mutations, but it tells us this is a, a, a defined subgroup of biliary tract cancers that we should be treating differently. Which regimen? I think there are a couple challenges to just decide which one right now. We can't do that. And one of the challenges is the heterogeneity of how we're defining ERB2 positive or HER2 positive and um, different cutoffs for the IHC, different uh, use of amplification. And so I think that's one key point is that we need to really rigorously look at how to define this population. And then secondly, I think, um, you know, the toxicity profiles will be important to look at. You know, when we look at the TDXD, it's a lot of biliary tract cancers are higher incidence in Asian patients, um, and there may be a higher rate of pneumonitis or lung toxicity. And so we have to really have a, a clear-cut plan for, for monitoring that with the um, ADC context in particular, um, and so I, I think that's the future. Is these studies need to clearly define defini uh, how we define HER2 positive, and also be able to compare contrast toxicity profiles in a large population. 
So I want to thank our faculty for coming uh, here this morning. Thank you for coming. Come on back tonight. We're going to be talking about prostate cancer. Have you heard of the Embark study? We'll be talking about that and a lot more PARP inhibitors, et cetera, tonight. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you.